Hey, everybody, welcome back to Uninformed Summary. It's a podcast where we talk about a person or a topic in history and how that person or topic relates to our story. That's today's times. And this week, we're going to be talking about a very creepy topic the Dungeons and Dragons Satanic Panic. And my name is Vinny. I'm in the hot seat. That means I did the most homework research for this episode. And after me this week in research levels is drum roll. Oh, that that's that's probably me. Hi, <laughs> I'm Molly. Um, I did some research. Quantifiably, that's that's some at least. Yep. Third in line in terms of homework this week is is Scott, and I would be remiss if I didn't say hello on a D and D episode, of course. Followed by Matt, which theoretically did the least homework, which is true. I did zero homework for this episode, but right. I'm also our group's D&D boomer that has been playing Dungeons and Dragons since approximately 1987, I think. So, so before it was cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, he played right. D&D with Moses. I played <laughs> advanced D&D. Yeah, yeah, this is this that's is true. System. Before there was even addition numbers, it was just D. You didn't have a class. And you no, you had a some class. Guy. You didn't have a race. That's right. If you're an you just... if you're an elf, that was your class and race. None of this elf cleric nonsense. <laughs> no, no problem there. The disassociative reality stuff will come into play later. As far as what races uh, impacted the most by D and D human race and there's my segue um this uh story all really kind of starts in the 70s with um like a cool riff of guitar playing in the background and we're zooming into a very americana um sort of sacrifice oh no not yet oh just just (laughs) we're just shy of that but um (laughs) okay yeah, 1970s Americana, specifically Wisconsin, specifically um, Lake Geneva. And this is where the home of Gary Gygax resides. This is the man who, along with a, um, a partner, invented the game of Dungeons & Dragons. So we have a couple things to talk about if we're really going to understand this satanic panic stuff. Number one is Dungeons & Dragons heavily involved. A lot of you guys out there, if you're awake uh, to (laughs) uh, popular trends, are seeing an emergence of Dungeons & Dragons um, and nerd-style culture. If you're on the internet or if you're out in card shops, that kind of situation. Um, The company that owns this game, Wizards of the Coast, procured it a while ago. uh, Bought it from this man, Gary Gygax, who is its initial creator. And that's, and that's all we're going to say about that. Yep. Yeah. There's nothing current that matters. Again, history podcast. <laughs> so Ernest Gary Gygax, right, um, invents this game. But he does it in an interesting way um, as a devout Jehovah's Witness, which will come into play later. I did not know that. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of hard to accuse the man of a satanic game. Um, <laughs> his partner, David Lance Arneson the official co-creator credited is also notably a devout Christian. And before we cover the basis of what was satanic about the game in the U S media culture, like we got to steep ourselves in a little bit of the background. People compared it to J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis, kind of these materials, like these high fantasy devote, uh, uh, sorry, uh, disassociated from reality. Well, okay, but Tolkien was a devout Catholic, right? Like, pretty notably. And C.S. Lewis's books are steeped with Christian overtones and good beats evil. And um, the major case that came against Dungeons & Dragons would would really be a media-driven panic, but it would be associated with the game's demonic imagery. Um, But before we get there, we'll get to, like... What was this Gary Gygax doing, making up a game of his own? Shouldn't he be busy? Uh, funny, he was unemployed at the time when he created this game uh, with, with his friend. 
And he was part of a culture that was really into the before times board gaming, like Matt's used to, tabletop gaming. But it was tactical at this point. And like, Matt, I don't know, do you have any experience playing games that are these tactical oh, yeah. military tons. games, right? Oh, so, yeah, tons. Can... They're dry as <laughs> fucking hardtack that has been through a dehydrator. Literally, like... one of them's called hardtack, by the way. It's a you Civil have War to... sim, so. You... <laughs> that's, that's hilarious. Like, you have got to... Be... I've played some of these games, and you have got to be willing to suffer for little tiny nuggets of fun that might come along if you just suffer long enough <laughs> in some of these um, games. <laughs> so, so one of those games called Marriage? <laughs> oh, I bet. I'm sure there's one. There's a game of life. Mm-hmm. Well, my wife doesn't listen to this, so I'm, I'm fine to say that. <laughs> the, the simulations that these games took on were, as Matt alludes to, quite dry, quite vanilla, you might say. They're not steeped in magical lore and fantasy, but... This is the basis of the modern um, tabletop or role-playing game. But back then, it was more like Risk. You would have two players fighting against each other in a, in a pretty strict side-against-side. Side. But the way dungeon uh, masters work in the D&D game is similar to the way the referee would work in these tabletop strategy games. So Gygax... And his friends, Arneson, in a super Christian, totally normative uh, way, were enjoying these kinds of games. And when Gary gets laid off from his job, he begins cobbling shoes to make some money, spending more time in the basement with the miniatures. Super healthy. Um, totally, you know, associated with reality. But comes up with this fantastic game, um, him and Arneson. And it's, 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 uh, it's chain mail. This is a, a simulation of medieval combat. And it started to do something really interesting that tabletop games at the time were not, which is it creates a role, right? We talk about Dungeons and Dragons, it's a role playing game. This was Chainmail, was one of the first games uh, that did this as well. It made you just one person. Um, so this is the beginning of like making a character. And. Gygax and Arneson playtest this content of what what is happening. They're making like a side game, and it's just called the fantasy game. Uh, they don't really have a name for it. They don't really have a structure for it. But it's building off of Chainmail's rules. Because, of course, you know, gamers like these guys were never really satisfied with just one game. You always are looking for the next edition or iteration. They would write supplements to these deep fantasy style story games, um, the progenitors to what Dungeons and Dragons is. But notably, there's no Satan or demons or summoning Cthulhu in like games like Chainmail or Hardtack. The Civil War simulator doesn't have devils in it, right? So no one's going to really get that swept up. Alexander Hamilton stands on the battlefield, staring down Cthulhu and talking about tax plans. <laughs> so, right, yeah, that's not... I'm going home, guys. That's not a fun game, but it doesn't necessitate that necessarily violent, terrible, horrible carnage is a part of the game either, right? It was more so my side rolls dice of probabilities and we calculate the success chances against your army and and then we win the war just like it was done in history yay and we button up our top button and go home right this is an american style of board gaming it's very much in the same vein as family gaming um it's supposed to be a really innocent space and guy but... played it with his kids yeah exactly yeah and he did they play tested it that was the initial audience, Gygax's family. So I, I have to ask you before we deep, deep dive into satanic stuff, does that sound, uh, you know, <laughs> on its face, like de evil and demonic bad intentions to corrupt the entire youth of America? I, I do, to answer that question, I do want to say that, and I, I, this actually hasn't been said yet, but all of us that are on this podcast are in we are in a D&D &D group together. Hey. It's actually how we all met. Yes. Right. Um 
and and with that in mind i mean i feel like all of our games obviously lead to we sacrifice children and do all that stuff but that's just because <laughs> that's what we want to do in real life oh my God. right so obviously no obviously that's not the not the case but um but yeah i do i did want to at least say that that uh i mean i think we're all on like what are like almost fourth fourth campaign together now and uh only Thanks. once have we sacrificed anyone yeah. Abs yeah absolutely yeah i mean well once or twice sometimes you got to get a hit of the good stuff and you do a little demon summoning ritual and it's like a big well in that case it I was, was summoning a, a god i know, was so. against it i was against the sacrifice yeah. in that case so i wasn't even saying. there <laughs> It's funny. Oh, no, talk... I think we're actually talking. Oh, sorry. Go, go ahead. Scott. <laughs> yeah, let's no, we actually did sacrifice a guy in a campaign, but that was, you know, and then we. Oh, yeah, no, an I wasn't, I wasn't there. My character okay. was not there for that. He was, he was oh, doing his own. Good save. Yep. Good save. <laughs> this dichotomy so. of I versus my character comes up hardcore later down our, our sort of uh, discourse line. But at this point, we're in the nascent stage of a game that is being played. Okay, you guys know Monopoly. It's got pieces established. You know who's the car. You know where the board is and where the chance cards are. In this game, though, Dungeons & Dragons, uh, Gygax and his kids, and Arneson, who comes over, and they bring, like, the neighborhood over, and the garage doors open, and, like, um, Gygax's wife, Mary Jo's cooking. You know, really nice food for everybody, feeding the, the whole group. They're on note cards. You know, they're just playing in their head what's called the theater of the mind is emerging as the, the board of this game, a shared narrative, right? Um, mm -hmm. Certain rules govern play. And I should take a moment to, if you don't know the intricacies of D and D here, I've brought this 400 page book. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding, but it can be overwhelming. So I'm going to break it down. Most basic form. You ready? You guys ready? Yeah. Here you go. Players take on a fictional role of a character, which they themselves create. This character's job, vis uh, using rather the game's rules and the sort of laws written as guidance, narrates a scenario or a story, or sorry, participates in the narrative of a scenario or story. And this is all refereed by uh, a person called the Dungeon Master, the one who tells the players um, what's happening, what's about to happen. He, she shapes the world, offers paths of action, and then mitigates or narrates those outcomes using dice. Those dice calculate success, chances, um, all that damage that's done when you swing a sword and hit somebody. The dice tell you how big of a cut or how uh, uh, deep of a stab your sword uh. goes in. Um, things like that. So it takes place around a table where basically everyone's telling us a story together. And uh, the demonology has really not set in here yet, except in certain portions of the game's storytelling, where good fights evil. And if you can imagine, these guys who are really historically minded start to bring in referential material and write it into their game, this fantasy mm -hmm. game, where demons take shape, or... Stories of old devils get mixed into the lore uh, of the world they're creating and presented to the players as bad guys. Right? We're yep. pretty familiar with that. There's some pretty old stories I can scratch my head and think of where uh, a really bad guy lives in a place of lots of fire and brimstone and <laughs> the whole red and the horns and the pointy, pointy stick. And these are the images yeah, that are being used. <laughs> yeah. Let's not beat around the bush here, right? So. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I will also say too, it's like if if you guys have ever played the team building exercise, and I say you guys meaning the audience, of uh, someone's going to say a word, the person to their right is going to say the next word, and we're just going to keep going. We're going to uh, see what you know, uh, what this story becomes, you know. And someone's like I, and the next person's like went, and the next person's like to the store to buy some alcohol. Bad Timmy. You're seven, quit drinking alcohol. Nah, nah, nah. Um, but the whole point is, is that that is essentially a very uh, rudimentary version of what D&D &D is, is that we all together create a story uh, as opposed to just one person saying, I went to the store to buy alcohol. 
not as much fun. Right. Then what happened? That's like the famous next last words in D and D. Yes, and yes, and yeah. the the shared narrative. And here we are. But thanks, guys. What a great segue to get into um, the sharing part of the shared narrative. Now these folks together that would hang out every week, sit down at a table together, share stories. Does this sound familiar? They wanted to do something more now. They're like, we like this game, this fantasy game. We want to we wanna do it for real and sell it because everyone in the neighborhood likes it. Cool. So they get like $2,000 together, and that is not yet enough to get it published and really sent out. So they, they pick up a few more people in the investment process. And now in alliance with a, a company of games called Gaidon, or I'm, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, Gideon, Gaidon Games, uh, that Gygax picks up work for, He's selling them games like Chainmail and like making supplements for their other tabletop games. He gets a bunch of investment money, four thousand dollars total. So back then, that's probably what six billion dollars in today's money. Yes, <laughs> no. on a math sliding scale. Math, yeah. math checks out. <laughs> <laughs> they create this small business called TSR, it stands for Tactical Studies Rules, which kind of follows along the different war games rules or war strategy rules names of production companies in this field. Super popular, where all the ladies flock to the field of simulation and tabletop games. But they get this publishing done. And in 1974, Gygax, Arneson, there's other names, Don Kay and Brian Bloom as investors, they publish the first box set of Dungeons and Dragons, which is assembled all from the home of Gygax family in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. So they make a thousand copies of this and they sell it out in the, in the year. 1974. Yay. Everyone loves it. Um, and nothing bad ever happens about that again. Podcast over. I want to thank everyone for watching Uninformed <laughs> Summary. You can follow Vinny. <laughs> you follow me at The Real Satan. No, the, uh, <laughs> the disclaimer here is what's going to happen next is we're going to encounter a media driven panic that is related to crime and what it's going to do is, is focus or put the focus of some pretty tragic stuff, um, you know, heads up. The next subjects are going to contain stuff like, you know, crimes and suicides and, and psychiatric problems and um, pretty sad cases here. They're going to be blamed even more sadly on the same type of behavior I described before. Sitting around the table together, telling stories, sharing snacks, drinking your pop or whatever. Soda, Coke, if you're in the South, out there. But they're shared narratives that a certain other group of people start to sort of twist into a satanic panic. That goes along with the rest of society's moral panic in this time. But here we go. So multiple cases of tragedy start to be linked via the media to the popular rising game, right? The game itself is gaining traction. Um, the next year they sell more than a thousand copies and the sales continue up until there's some coverage of a particular uh, really sad suicide. And this ignites uh, the media's attention to Dungeons and Dragons. It's the case of a, of a college kid named James Dallas Egbert III. And this is like the I first they use that name case. three times. Yeah, <laughs> the, the two James uh, Dallas Egbert's senior. Um, we're probably not going to meet a fate like this, but uh, he was a boy genius, believe it or not. 16 years old, he was a student already at Michigan University. And uh, he became a freshman there when he was 15. So really smart, really creative, very driven individual, but uh, his legacy wasn't bound to last he, he played that satanic game where they summon demons and his D, &D group um, was his best friends careful that's your first sign but what happened here is he had these psychiatric problems and depression and anxiety and he complained often to his friends about pressures from his parents and uh, the pressure to perform well in school and to find yourself and oh yeah he's like 16 but this game um did actually 
influence, you could say he used it in, to express some of these problems he was having. And he disassociated from reality. Um, he went missing along with a note that referenced suicide. And this was August 15th, 1979. So five years after the game comes out, right? Um, and Boy Genius goes missing. Suicide note referencing this game, Dungeons and Dragons. It's kind of a made for media case. Hmm. His parents hire a private investigator named William Dean, who kind of tracks down the clues. And you know what they, fu- you know what they fucking found? Um, a battle map. For you players out there, familiar, it's like a little hex grid. And the detective, to his credit, puts together this battle map. It's actually the exact shape of the steam tunnels underneath Michigan University. Wow. Yeah, combines some local blueprints. Listen, he gets some clues from the, the people he's, the Egbert's playing the game with, right? So he interviews all of them. Can you imagine? Knock, knock, knock on your doors. We need to talk to you about your friend who, about your... I heard you were playing that Dungeons and Dragons game. Shame on you. In an in a interrogation room. But eventually they put together the story. And through literally interviewing the players of the game, they find out that this kid, he, he lost it and thought his game was real and broke his mind, sort of. He was trying to live action role play the game in the Steam Tunnels. Like? Went missing. Uh. Oh. You're, What's I can see the wheels name? turning. Inventor's game. Oh, um, Titanius Anglesmith, the fancy, fancy man of Cornwood. Fancy man of Cornwood. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. References here for Dungeons and Dragons, but yeah, that's a um, that's a great take on losing reality mm. and becoming your character, so to speak. This happened to poor James Dallas Egbert III. And when he resurfaced from the steam tunnels, uh, he was actually communicating with his player group and he was in another state. Excuse me. He was in another state entirely, but he was alive. They found him. And a year later, he committed suicide, unfortunately. Um, He did not blame the game for that, but the media who covered the case started to uh, when details emerged. And on top of that, I don't know how I'm feeling cynical about t- this, but the detective also wrote a book about the whole thing and titled it The Dungeon Master. So a few years after that case, he, he you know, I find this a little distasteful, but he sold a book about his case where he's sort of blaming Dungeons and Dragons for this awful suicide, where you can clearly tell, if you look a little deeper, that the individual has some mental problems and could have used a different kind of help. Well, he's well, he's at what age? Fifteen. Yeah, he started college at fifteen. So... His blood pressure. He complained about it often. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he like sought advice and help, but the culture at the time, um, in his in his family was not driven toward right examining that mm-hmm. that type of behavior. Instead, it was more like, why don't you go play that hard tech civil war game instead? That'll make yeah. a man out of you. Here's a cigarette. Now, I'm generalizing, but that's the whole, the counter generalization is people would be so scared to face the facts of mental illness that they would maybe project those ills onto what's the first thing around? Uh, there's a pentagram on that video game, that book he's reading, the Dungeons and Dagrons. It must be that. So the detective took this interest and he helped the media spin it out. They made a movie about this called mazes and monsters i just i just wanted to add i there's a lot of problems with the investigation that that private investigator did like from the the version that i've heard of it is like he basically when he got into the guy's room he saw some D stuff and he just kind of ran with it like to the exclusion of other leads which is like classic bad investigation you know like you find one thing and you think it's interesting and then you just start pursuing that and ignore any other of the stuff that's going on. So like you said, like he ignored the mental health issues. He ignored the fact that he'd maybe been pushed into going to college early when he was so young. And he's just like, nope, I think it's this, this weird game that I found that I don't understand. (laughs) 
and indefinitely projecting that blame is going to keep coming up. And that's just like case one, 1979 of what we're going to cover of almost like a uh, 15, 16, depending on where you put it, year public you know, panic over this. People fear what they don't understand. Yeah, it's often the case. Um, Rona Jaffe is this cosmopolitan journalist who, who picks up the story and then writes this um, book, which gets turned into a TV movie called Mazes and Monsters. And it, it bases its main character off of Egbert, uh, played by none other than Tom Hanks. Huh. Yeah, it's his first, it's his first like, uh, film work that gets notoriety, and it's on a, a TV movie you know, schedule. But yeah, that's his. Hey, now I'm torn. I love Tom Hanks. Guys, watch the movie. Huh. Cheese. So good. Um, but also it does sort of point to the Egbert case um, as mental health. It, it knows a little bit. Um, and this is case one. So, oh, not open and shut, but definitely a misplaced blame here. Cause of suicide. Case two. Um, that really kind of highlights this panic is another suicide. But a young man in Virginia shoots himself in the chest, Irving Lee Pulling, a Dungeons & Dragons player, left a suicide note, six in total, actually. For But they reference the game directly. And this one's tough to separate, guys. Um, it's hard to make the case against involvement of some kind. He had D&D dice in his pocket, the day that he uh, shot himself. So, you know, they took that evidence and they said, you know what? It's definitely because of this game for sure. Open and shut case. No other questions needed. Yep, it's the dice. The, the dice must have shot him. <laughs> you know, because of the devil or something. You know, and yeah, a one in 20 chance, man. It's a really brutal crime scene. I'm not going to spend too much time detailing it, but it was... Definitely self-inflicted gunshot wound. And the notes detailed a lot of trouble with this teen, Irving Lee pulling, um, with the family. His mom and dad were both having simultaneous affairs with a really broken marriage. Very Christian household. Um, and his notes basically said, hey, I feel it. I'm hearing voices. Yeah, yeah. Urging me towards violence. So he says he's going to take it out on himself instead. <clears throat> it also references to the game's chagrin a curse that was placed on his uh, his self as he seems to have blended with his character in the game. So unfortunately, there is this crossover that his mother, Patricia Pulling, becomes famous actually as she advocates for how much D and D caused this tragedy. She sues the school for a million dollars. Yeah, tries to sue the principal directly. And I hate this chick. <laughs> yeah, she's real bad, guys. It gets worse. She remember that company that Gary Gygax made in his Jehovah's Witness uh, garage? She sues them for ten million. Slaps a lawsuit on. Finds attorneys who are willing to take this on because now it's really picking up public steam. Oh man, we can blame this game. This other bad things are happening. We saw that Mazes and Monsters movie. Uh. So these lawsuits go nowhere, though. <laughs> um, judges throw them right out uh, because they have some sense, and they go, "No way! You know, you can't, you can't blame this game. You can't blame this game company. And why do you want all this money? You know, for this, they didn't do it." So there's some reality to uh, the fact that this kid was playing a lot of Dungeons and Dragons. So his mom dropped it. It was fine. She never really brought it up again. I'm just kidding. She founded an organization. Patricia Bowling founded Bothered About Dungeons and Dragons. Spelling bad. B-A-D-D. And started crusading. And um, through the early 80s and mid-80s, Patricia Bowling collaborating with others. Basically, oh, people like Tipper Gore. She collaborated with, with all kinds of public figures to put the word out that this game was going to corrupt your kids. So using crime as a way to sort of fan the flame of worry um, 
Patricia Pulling is is sort of our case number two highlighting this panic. Have you guys ever heard of her before this? Yes, I have. I Magda, if, yeah. if I can add some stuff to what I know about her, like so you said she worked with like famous people. She also worked with police departments. Um, yeah. So a little intersection with my other job. Um, she built herself as an expert and her her bad group put out these like guides that they would give to police officers that would tell them like, so if you run across the Dungeons and Dragons player, these are the questions you should ask them. Like, what level is your guy? And what <laughs> what what class is your guy? Because they don't understand the difference between their character and themselves. So if you know, if they if they if they think of themselves as a magic user, then that might mean X, Y, Z. And like yes. I've read these guides that they put out, and it's just like absolutely insane. And she's not an expert. She doesn't have like a degree in psychology or like any of this. It's yeah. just like a bad thing happened to her son, and she decided that, you know, she is gonna declare herself an expert and like make this a thing. <laughs> very, very so adding on what happened at the scene of the crime itself is there's some articles that I'll source and I'll, I'll fling them into the comments. Don't forget to smash that like button. <laughs> this cop at the scene interviewed, you know, Patricia and he's like, so are you guys devil worshipers? I noticed he's got dice in his pocket, you know, he's got a key and which, where does that key go? You know, does he have a secret stash of devil worshiping material? So she, Patricia sees this too as a chance where she can recoil from like the negative attention and come out as a crusader. And she, she does that for a long time, even landing. So years later, she publishes a book in 1989 year I was born um, about this panic. Um, so she, she kept on it. She never really let it go. She ended up on a 60 minutes episode in 1985 with Gary Gygax, uh, not in the same room, but they aired two separate interviews. Sort of like, hey, this lady thinks you're corrupting the entire nation's youth. And Gary Gygax's response is pretty, you know, predictable. You know, get get out of here. That's crazy. So, case of Patricia Polling doesn't end uh, super happily, but we're going to move over to case number three, which is someone Patricia would encounter and work with. Thomas Radicky or Radecki is another driver of this panic um he's a psychiatrist and a chairman of the national coalition on television violence which is just another public policy lobbying group in washington dc you know the smartest people in the world they know everything <laughs> absolutely um and radicky who never has done anything wrong in his life did tv shows and appearances with polling and together they worked hard to cancel Dungeons and Dragons um, for all the demon stuff, you know, because it's killing the world, right? So, 1985, they got the the D and D uh, Saturday morning. They attacked your Saturday morning, and they canceled the Dungeons and Dragons cartoon. So, really canceled. yeah, you got. I'm not kidding. They canceled D and D. <laughs> um, you know, tongue in cheek, but they did it. CBS Television's program was canceled because of specific public policy lobbying efforts and social push from led by Radicky and Polling. Um, and they also began to attack Gygax's company TSR. Right? These these nerds are turning the nation into a bunch of devil worshippers. And the response was pretty tactical. So okay, you got a psychiatrist bombing your company guys brainstorming session we're a media conglomerate if a psychiatrist yep. comes after us what's our strategy oh no yeah like you can't punch him because it's not civil <laughs> then be it's so what okay gygax gets his brain trust together a secret satanist ritual <laughs> and they summon the devil just fight kidding. Fire with fire. Fight fire with fire is correct. Molly. <laughs> they they in response hired the famous psychiatrist Joyce Brothers wow. to start. Yeah, <laughs> look her up if you guys were not. Matt knows exactly who that is. <laughs> that that was what I was gonna say was is you know hire hire those people. Yeah. So Joyce, that was my 
<laughs> Scott, man. Little, little, um, little nod to Joyce Brothers, who was famously a compassionate um, psychiatrist in the public eye. And she defended the game for money, albeit. But she was famous for saying, look, the elements that we're all seeing and talking about are part of a two-way street where the game pits good against evil. And it's important to remember that in this game, it's designed for good to triumph over evil. An opinion which Gygax was, you know, partial to, I think, uh, us as players. Do you guys agree? You ever played an like... evil campaign? Yeah, sometimes the game is specifically turned evil, and we'll talk about that in the next case. But I, I have a very strong agreement with Brother's statement there, not just as a bias holding D and D player, um, but everything about it. You know, the story of Gary Gygax's uh, family endeavors to just enjoy a new type of game and create it themselves. That seems to be a good notion. The game's not bad, but these people. It's way better to be good against evil. Yeah. Joyce Brothers. I, I would say the general consensus is definitely like if, I, if, if ever I'm in a campaign and something happens that's morally ambiguous, I, I'm like, oh, OK, so this is the campaign we're playing in because that's not the tradition. Yeah. And like you can see that in like all kinds of media too. Like, you know, I mean there are like morally ambiguous stories, but like what are the most popular stories? It's like Star Wars and Marvel and like, you know, stories where the good guys triumph over evil. That's like what the majority of people that are out there want to play. And I think that's true of most D and D players too. And if you're Gary Gygax, it's like the Bible's events made their way. Conan the Barbarian, um, comic book uh stories that the guys in their basements again gary cobbled shoes for a while artisan was another devout they hung out in churches together this was the circle that the creators ran in hard for me to believe that they intended uh to have to defend their product against satanism accusations but it persisted and this all the way up till 85 they're on you know 60 minutes side by side so 11 years after they make their fun garage game It'll be a blast, they said. Let's publish a game, they said. Now they're in lawsuits. You know, they're skyrocketing sales, too. This case, this, you know, 79 case and the subsequent attention from people like pulling had an amazing effect on sales. <laughs> yeah, it did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's Ain't no like bad publicity. Nine million dollars in sales by like 1980. If I'm remembering Damn. my years right, something along the lines of... um Polling and the other media attention helped quadruple sales within like a two year period as well. It was insane. Uh, and it's kind of funny to look behind the scenes at people like Radicky. As I mentioned before, he was the canceller. He got he canceled D and D. Um, totally fine, right? Angel in his own right. Sure. Except, except no, because in 1992, <laughs> Radicky would have his medical license revoked. He was discovered to be prostituting women for drugs in his psychiatric practice. Uh, so, yeah, big problematic there. And um, uh, in, again, in 2016, Radicky's quote, rehab center, which is not legally being run, was found to be prostituting women for opioid use. So he would trade these opioids uh, for sex. Oh, my God. Which sounds to me, I'm going to make a quick side be sad comparison. <laughs> Which sounds worse? Hey, we meet every Friday night. We roll Icosagog and all dice, and we uh, we we talk about fighting demons. Or uh, I'm gonna trade a woman for sex. <laughs> so it sounds uh, to me this is a tough one. Scott, don't think too hard about it. Okay. All right. It's the Radicky one. He's the bad guy. D and D is the good guy. I was leaning that way. Very good. So, um, according to the prison sentence, Radicky should be in jail until he dies. But again, better get that uh, crazy D and D stuff out of the way. So that's case number three. That sort of highlights we're working through the mid '80s into um, more and more coverage. Right, you're on sixty minutes. That's a pretty big deal for a guy who used to trace Conan the, Car the Barbarian. And like overlay those images into the the manuals that he made for his homespun fantasy games. By the way, fun fact: they totally stole tons of comic art. Yeah, we were talking about that earlier. <laughs> yeah, side by side comparisons reveal 
it was pretty lazily done and maybe they didn't know they'd never be found out but that <laughs> might be one of the deeper crimes that they're guilty of guys it's like they traced they traced comics you know oops there's like uh, a, a, a actually deep history and like in like games in general of that happening because a lot of times like you design a game and you're like oh we're gonna print a thousand copies like this is our passion project. You know, it'll be cool if other people are playing it, but nobody's ever going to see this crap and, you know, <laughs> and notice. <laughs> and then it, like it explodes and they're like, oh shit, people are seeing this crap and noticing. <laughs> and there, yes, because of the exposure, because yeah. it was never meant to be like this. I, I, I think Matt, that's a great, another great segue. Um, it was never supposed to be like this. They were never supposed to be defending their game on the public sphere because. It was a passion project. It was a nerd corner, right? A sort of safe space for these kind of people, if I may borrow the the term and like knock it out of its time. But yeah. So 1984 is another bad one. We're going to keep going on these cases. Um, a, a famous murder of a young woman um, is blamed again on D&D. &D. And this is, this is an interesting highlight because... Now you're starting to see people scapegoating it knowingly. There's the tragic strangulation of a lady named Mary Toey, 18 year old, uh, associated with a D and D player, possibly armed and dangerous. <laughs> Darren Lee Molitor <laughs> with a short sword. Uh, probably plus one for sure, <laughs> which means, uh, you know, you should probably. It's a three star <laughs> pursuit, and so Darren Lee Molitor and uh, an accomplice essentially break into Mary Toey's house and start to use this mental domination tactic that they think they've pulled from their time playing Dungeons and Dragons. They think they're freaking magic users or, you know, casting spells on this girl and they tie her up and they use an adhesive bandage to like, they wrap it around her airway and they make a mistake and wrap it too tight in this weird simulation they're doing which has got to be somewhat sexual let's be let's be square here but it goes too far and in the process of this um fantasy playing out she dies the two men freak out and molitor and the other guy whose name i forget sorry lost the time um they steal a gun from the house and they steal that family car and they drive but by the time the girl's body is discovered, they've turned themselves in. They've come down off the high, right? They've, they've, the devil's out of them and they turn themselves in. But then they go to trial and Molitor is like, no, you guys, it's not fair. You should have let me, they don't let him submit his um, defense, which is D&D &D made me do it, which is notably bullshit by now. <laughs> and even the media on this case, they get their court date in 1985 and the media is there. And he's like, D&D made me do it. And everyone's like, no, no, no. It's starting to fade from the ability to just be so directly for this stuff. So there's another case, um, but it's being fought because 1984, same year, this crazy publication, Dark Dungeons, comes out by a Christian author of comics named Jack Chick. <laughs> um, Matt's giggling because he knows. <laughs> <sighs> Jack Chick, chick runs, tracks. <laughs> yeah, the Chick Tracks or Chick Publications um, is is the namesake of this hyper Christian publishing company. They love to demonize Dungeons and Dragons in their work because it could make money from Christian families, and they did very well. Uh, fun fact about Chick Publications: uh, today, the Southern Poverty Law Center has listed Chick Publications as an active hate group. So I ask again, who's a dick? <laughs> there's a dick is it dungeons and dragons so this theme comes up again so fun fact number two um about wait be Jack before you move on is dungeons and dragons on the southern poverty law centers no there are in fact a long list of charities associated with uh, dungeons and dragons players and advocates so okay i thought so yeah yeah great question yeah you would think with all the demonology stuff mm -hmm. but no um, well, we'll talk about Chick a little bit more now. So he makes this series of tracts 
short comics that could be picked up for publication inside like your teen beat bible magazine and the mo- most popular one is called dark dungeons um a bunch of D nerds formed an entertainment company gotta pay attention called zombie orpheus mm-hmm. entertainment and they started a kickstarter in 2014 which funded the movie adaptation so let's just set the scene a bunch of people who play D write a letter to jack chick and chick publications and say we want to make a movie about your stuff and they they don't even like mock it they're just we and chick publications gives them the rights full on go ahead so in the movie dark dungeons which is a total mockery of this <laughs> just so you guys know um they they mock it up and down and they play off of this hate and you know moral panic it's listed in the credits you know special thanks to chick publications um for the rights to the movie so people found a way to turn this kind of hate on its head in 2014 thought it would be a fun fact but these things were so popular in their time that families were reading picking up and going anyone who plays this game oh my god they must be tainted by the devil itself so 1985 if you're watching tv you're flipping through the news you see the, the court case of darren molitor strangling this girl to death you're seeing um, Saturday morning cartoon gets canceled all in 1985. And the same year is when the 60 Minutes um, episode crashes onto the scene and really the height of this sensation of d and satanic panic. Um, so yeah, I mentioned this before, but I want to talk about how that panic affected the game and it just skyrocketed sales. Um, after the 60 Minutes episode in 1985, I think I said 1980 prior, so bump that up. Give it a plus five. Okay. Where they were selling it to like seven hundred fifty thousand a year. So, think about the difference in Gary Gygax's garage now versus the first time they had to scrounge four grand and like put together <laughs> their board game. <laughs> so it's going all Apple computer, you know? Yeah. <laughs> oh shit! From the garage up, Jeffrey Bezos. <laughs> <laughs> he's becoming the man and this does affect him guy Gyga- i'll briefly inter- intersect here which i don't really care about but gygax has skyrocketed to fame and there's a lot of stuff that goes on that's problematic with with his rise to fame and his family and his faith and stuff kind of go through a lot of ups and downs and people around him accuse him of a lot which <laughs> some of it is justifiable um but that, that, there's a big reason why the podcast's uh, topic of conversation was not Gary Gygax yeah. and the creation of Dungeons Dragons. It is Dungeons and Dragons separate. And I hope that at least the opinion that is can be taken from this is at no point are we treating Gary Gygax with reverence as anything more than just a basic indifference of what the game is versus who the person that created it was. Yeah, I mean, look, credit where it's due. The the gentleman was involved in the making of a game that's that's been popularized, but this story gets a little thicker in terms of Gygax and how much control he really has over the game. Um, notably, 1989 is a year um, where Gygax yields, and the company, TSR, is under a lot of pressure. Backlash left and right. These cases keep coming where people are blaming D&D and dunking on it. And uh, they, re- they succumb to some pressure and they remove certain monsters from the game. So the equivalent would be like if you were playing a video game and you were fighting the boss and it just disappeared. Right? The publications remove certain demons from... We did it! Yeah, we win. <laughs> the panic's over. You know? Um, a lot of energy spent... And TSR was forced to remove these monsters that spells or uh, themes, we should say, in a broader sense, from the material which made the game. In many ways, pulling had a victory here. And people like that had a victory against um, what they thought was evil. Um, But later on, when they weren't looking, that panic died down, you know. Um, 1992, there was uh, one, or, one or two more 
dramatic pop-ups of the panic in public view. Uh, but really, by the mid-90s, attention simply started to fizzle out uh, into other problems in the mass media. The, the wave was kind of over. Um, and sales studied out. The game's appeal remained. People kept playing on. But business moves ended up seeing the company that Gygax created being purchased by a larger entity known as Wizards of the Coast. Um, and you saw a professional rebranding of the game. You're seeing other things like editions coming out, first edition, second edition, third edition of the game. So many collaborators now that it would be impossible to pin themes on only one author or person. Um, and at this point, other problematic icons in other problematic phases of society or sectors of society were just, like I said, taking the camera away. Um, so now, by, by today, um, again, uh, with no concern on the creators or the sort of business heads of the game, we see a different picture entirely. Um, and I think of those of us who play this game, and I wonder, how could any one of us associate this fun thing that we do that has this enormous following? How could it be evil? But that was an everyday thought back then. And those are just a few yeah. cases, you know? Um, yeah, so I have my own personal case to add to that, if I may. Oh so God, when, I was in, when I was in high school, I played uh, D&D, and I had a friend who not only was he allow not allowed to play D&D &D because his mom thought it was the devil, but <laughs> um, she would let him play Magic the Gathering, but he was not allowed to use any dice. Like, a uh, lot of times in Magic the Gathering, you use dice to, like, track your, uh, your hit points and stuff. And he was not allowed to use dice because those were, like, connected to D&D &D and somehow the devil. <laughs> oh, well, hey, that's not too far off, man. That's so sad. Yeah. But so, I mean, that was, in the, that was in the 90s, like, when it was petering out, like you said. But um, so just personal story. And then I also have another question for you guys. Have you ever heard of a Batazu or a Tanarai? Yes. Yep. Okay. That's that's the name that D and D adopted for devils and demons during this whole thing when they like were trying to steer away from the whole satanic panic thing. And I, so I just popped out my my fifth edition monster manual because I actually didn't know. And it's literally just under demons now. So they're back. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's back. Yeah. So uh, point of order that has a lot to do with Wizards of the Coast because they said uh, we don't care. And it didn't bother Wizards of the Coast, who had a lot more power, legal team defending power as well, to just be like, nope, we like this, we're going to do this. And they gave some power back to the originality of the game in that way. However you want to see it, though, that's your, that's your thing. Again, I don't want to get into the conversation of like company ethics or business ethics of d and I'll say this to modern day 2021. You can't look too far on the internet without seeing something Dungeons and Dragons related. And typically, that content's going to skew on the side of inclusion and love and fun and adventure, uh, interaction with an audience that's just looking for togetherness. It reminds me a lot of what it might have felt like in Gary Gygax's garage back in the good old days. Yeah. Yeah. I actually have a question for everyone, uh, if we want to go uh, down the line of, uh, we've been playing D&D &D together for a while now, um, but what would everyone say might be, uh, and maybe in the topic of goodness or general uh, not sacrificing dung farmers, <laughs> um, would you say is your favorite memory uh, in at least uh, in the campaigns that we've been in together. A character moment. I'll start with one just off the top of my head was, uh, you know, I was playing a uh, uh, my character Torvian, uh, who was privileged, that was learning how to uh, ride a cart, drive a cart, um, by Vinny's character, who was not as privileged. Um, and it just it created a funny little situation of my character uh, not really understanding the mannerisms or having like the thoroughbred nature 
to just go just you grab it you, you just say yeah you know <laughs> uh and my character responding okay yeah i think i've got it um yeah it was so pathetic uh, you know it was so beautifully done uh, <laughs> only because scott was capable at stepping into the role of his character Notably, though, if I could step on your time here, you came out of that fit of devil worshiping, right? You're you're still Scott today. Well, are we not doing the? Okay, I'll put the cloak away. It's fine. It's fine. Just for now, don't let I'm the assuming... audience find out. We're just, we're trying to. Yeah, yeah. What I, I saw well, that. What I saw uh... that. <laughs> yeah, I saw that part where uh, Matt uh, sent the uh, clear propaganda um thing <laughs> and i was starting to read it for a minute uh where if you play D D long enough then you find out that you can use satan powers yeah uh yeah. that's D D is just the entry point so yep referencing uh, that i'm just i'm still waiting on matt to teach me these spells i'm really excited um but with that said let's go back uh you know favorite memory yeah um i'll go sure i think the the, the one of the favorite memories i have of the game starts very early and goes to uh, the first dungeon master I ever had, Mike. Shout out, Mike, who's been. Um, we miss you. Uh, mm -hmm. So he had me create a character, and that was the moment I'm going to focus on. And I kept asking him questions like, okay, you're the referee, right? And he goes, well, dungeon master or game master. Some people don't like the way dungeon sounds. So one of my first experiences is a guy, Mike, who says, I want you to play the game. I don't want it to offend you, though. Pretty not satanic to me. <laughs> and I say, okay, I want to make a character like Legolas from Lord of the Rings who's going to jump around and shoot arrows all over the place. And, and he goes, absolutely. You want to be a good guy? I was like, yeah, who doesn't? And he, and he tells me a little bit about this stuff. So, well, some people like to play it as the bad guy. And some people think it's all about devil worship. Um, and that was my exposure to the game. So I made a character who was like a blonde main elf. I pretty much just copy and pasted like a list, let's be honest. And he let me play out my fantasy of being the goodest boy all throughout this game. Um, he did pit us up against the evils, but the character creation moment where he was like, you want, you want to be good, you should be as good as you can be. And it it quelled some of the fears I had about like the game being too hard to play or too far away from my traditional thoughts of fantasy. I want good to win. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And, and that is generally the consensus of anyone that's, that's playing uh, just to hammer home. That point is I have yet to play in a campaign where the point was for the bad guys to win, you know, I don't think I would play in that campaign, honestly. I've I've heard the evil campaign floated. And I don't think I can do it. Like I there might be a way that it could be done, but like I would not find that enjoyable. Right. Next person, wanna tell us your favorite memory? I have a favorite memory for about all of my campaigns because I seem to be the one that you can rely on when it comes to bringing Romance to the table. Mm -hmm. uh, you mean like on top of the table or like up against the table? Romance? Both. Nice. Did you have like a specifically romantic character moment that you had? Like, did that make the game pop? Or was that just more so, do you enjoy no, the game just, that's, because you get to have that experience I, too? I, I feel like that's one of my defining moments for our campaigns. It's like, oh, here, there goes Molly breaching the the romantic aspect of um, this fantasy game because I'm a sucker for romance. That bridges perfectly into mine because my favorite thing about role playing and most of my favorite role playing memories are where role playing has enabled me to step out of my comfort zone and to have kind of a safe space with people I trust to explore things that i wanted otherwise in my my normal life so like i've explored romance with uh some of molly's characters and i've role played a compulsive liar that is always just hustling for money and <laughs> for anybody that knows me those are like things that are like not stuff that 
I, that Matt would do in a million years. Um, but it's really cool to explore and like besides just being fun to do, it's helped me learn stuff about myself that I would not have learned about otherwise. That's the segue king. I I don't think we could put it better than what Matt just did. So I want to wrap this one up and say that the panic is over. It's all done. We beat evil and good wins and reigns for a thousand years apiece. Yay. Yay. We did it. We did it. <laughs> um, Wait, did something happen? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to make sure I put this in the record of our podcast. We had some tough themes here and a lot of us deal with a lot of problems and I found it appropriate to say that if you um, are listening to this or are one of us and you feel like suicide is too close to home to you, then there's the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800-273-8255 or 273-TALK. And it's an underutilized tool for people who just might need someone to talk to in a moment of truth. Um, so for anything else, Absolutely. Um, thanks for coming in this week and listening to Uninformed Summary. I've been Vinny, and I love you. Mwah. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Don't forget to like and subscribe, guys. We got some things coming up in the horizon. You can make certain to follow uh, Molly at Mallswald. Got it in one. Uh, two episodes in a row. <laughs> uh, two episodes in a row. I got that uh, correct, and then I messed up the uh, the the saying the rose. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you can follow Matt at Matchroll Twenty. Mm -hmm. You can follow me at that one loud guy, and you can follow Vinny at once again the real Ted Cruz. Uh, stay tuned. We would very much like it if you guys could subscribe to the YouTube. We are going to be coming out with a new form of content in the next two weeks that will not be posted on the regular scheduled typical Sunday afternoon. And role playing um, as so a drum. Very much. Yes. <laughs> Golden drum roll works on two levels. So please make certain to subscribe and pay attention to that. I, uh, you know, uh, we're hoping that you're going to like this new form of content. With all of that said, Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Make sure you like and subscribe. We will see you guys next week. Bye. 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 <laughs> I've done like I've done these before, so it's like no big deal anymore because I know how it's gonna go. Like they ask you this long list of questions, you say no, 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 and then they wait a second, and then they're like, "Well, Matt, when when I asked you about any sexual encounters with animals, I noticed a little bit of a." Uh, yeah, we call it an anomaly. We call it an anomaly. Um, <laughs> so we'll call it an anomaly. So I just wondered uh, if you wanted to explain that anomaly when I asked you about whether or not a dog had ever licked your dick. And you have to try and keep a straight face and be like, no, sir, I don't, I don't know why there would be an anomaly there. A dog has never licked my dick. Um, the dog's name definitely wasn't Corky, and I didn't put peanut butter on it. So I don't know why there would be an anomaly there. And he's like, okay, okay. He writes something down on his paper and he moves on to the next thing. So the cooler your cucumber is, the easier this goes. I know what part of uh, our podcast is going at the end of this week's episode. <laughs> <laughs>